Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Nautilus Live YouTube and Facebook for this live stream Explore at Home event. We're so excited to have this event shared with you all. And just a reminder, feel free to, to share questions and comments throughout the whole program in the, the comment section of both Facebook and YouTube. Um, so today we are sharing this event um, with a number of panelists who are ocean explorers, thinkers, and creatives that are not all ocean scientists and engineers. These event series are focused on sharing and meeting and engaging with explorers, part of our core of exploration, in addition to many others who work in overlapping fields. So today we're going to meet four very creative and interesting individuals who engage in science, technology, and art and use creativity throughout all of their work. And um, please feel free to, to join in the conversation throughout. So I'd like to invite to the stage um, Peyton Lee, Caleb Hawkins, Natasha Miller, and John Crawford. Welcome everybody. So can each of you give us a brief introduction on who you are and what you're working on? And yeah, let's start with, let's start with Peyton. All right. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Peyton Lee. I'm a undergraduate student at the University of Washington studying computer science and aquatic and fishery sciences. I explore intersections between technology, art, and marine science through games, comics, and robotics. Uh, I actually recently interned, uh, last year interned on the EV Nautilus and wrote a comic about that experience and also lead a robotics club at UW. Caleb, how about you? Hello everybody, uh, my name is Caleb Hawkins. I'm an architectural designer and artist, currently pursuing a Master of Design Studies degree at Harvard. Um, I'm a previous holder of an architecture degree um, as I practice in the field doing architecture and design. And currently um, I'm in a bit of a, a nice creative transition into visual arts and uh, installation work. Um, I work through built works, interactive pieces, um, a bit of robotics and projection work. Awesome. Natasha, how about you? Yeah, I am Natasha T. Miller, and I work as the Community Engagement Manager for Science Gallery Detroit, a science and art museum. Um, I am a poet. I travel the world to perform poems uh, in corporate settings and for universities. And uh, I'm a spokesperson for a brand here in Detroit called uh, Shinola Detroit. And John. Hi, everybody. I am an intermedia artist, which means I put together different kinds of media, almost always involving computers and video. Essentially, I'm a visual artist. Most of my work is in the realm of performing arts. I work a lot with dance and music and theater, and I put computers and video on stage with performing artists, as well as making pieces that get exhibited in various kinds of galleries. Um, I'm also a software developer. I write most of my own software for my projects, and I'm, I'm uh, trying to find ways that we can connect technology to make the world a better place. And in particular, I'm super interested in dealing with all kinds of ecological issues, our climate emergency and other related things. I'm also a professor at University of California, Irvine, in our School of the Arts, where I teach and work with research colleagues on all the things I just described. Wonderful. And my name is Megan Lubetkin, and I work for the Ocean Exploration Trust, who owns and operates the EV Nautilus, and I work on creative projects and exhibits for the Trust. So welcome, everyone, today. And for everyone who's joining us live, Again, feel free to share your questions and comments in the, in the chat and let us know where you're coming from as well. So let's get started. So can you each tell, share with everybody how you got interested in the fields you're working in and how you got to where you are today? Was there a breaking point that changed your path or converged with other interests? Caleb, how about, how about you start? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been involved with architecture, I feel like, for some time now. 
Um, I remember back during my uh, time in high school, actually, where um, I was interested in going into architecture, but spent a bit of time trying to prepare myself through my curriculum. Um, I had a wonderful opportunity to um, attend Concord High School in New Hampshire, where I was able to learn more about math, um, tech ed, and art. Um, and between these th three genres of study in high school, um, I learned a bit more about um, the kind of boundary or buffer between how these things could be related. Um, and throughout architecture school, um, as I attended Wentworth Institute of Technology, I learned a great deal about the profession, as well as uh, creative means in developing ideas, uh, not just architecture, but um, uh, ideas in general, I think, in terms of uh, design thinking and uh, design processes. Uh, but so after my education in architecture, I'd worked in the field for some time, having a great uh, having great experiences working at various design offices, typically um, smaller scale work where um, I sat on the boundary between doing computational design and 3D modeling, but also being able to fabricate and run CNC mills and um, different types of uh, uh, making machines. And so I felt grateful to be situated in a, a, a space where I could have a hand in both, um, one being digital and then one being very hands-on and physical. Um, but throughout my time in architecture, uh, the projects I was involved, although very engaging in both of these things, I felt um, didn't quite do enough for me to uh, speak about uh, certain life issues um, in regards to the social justice. And um, I was searching for a certain agency in my own creative work. So after developing some of these skills throughout my architectural education, as well as gaining experience within the field, um, I had made the decision to return to school um, where I'm currently pursuing my degree. Uh, while I've been in this, uh, this path, I've had an opportunity to dig into new mediums, new methods of making, which are still inherent into my uh, personal process of designing and building. But I've been seeking ways to uh, have these artifacts, objects, spaces, installations uh, speak more to the things that I thought were absent in some of my previous work. Um, so looking back at it, it's been a long story and a, a, a definitely a cumulative snowball, if you will, of uh, um, learning more and experiencing more and allowing myself to uh, follow my own inner drive and where my heart takes me and uh, what I see as valuable work. Awesome. Wonderful. Uh, Peyton, how about you? How did you get started and, and what inspired you to do what you're up to now? Yeah. Um, so I sort of knew from a pretty early age that I was interested in marine sciences. Um, I actually, in high school, started volunteering at the Seattle Aquarium. Um, and that was like a really cool experience because at the time they were running creative projects. Uh, like this was from the Creativity Inspiring Conservation Program, where they basically held workshops for students to explore like using art, sculpture, painting to deliver conservation messages and to advocate for the environment. Um, and that eventually led to me joining the volunteer program in full uh, and sort of building my skills as an advocate and a public speaker. Um, and so that was a really cool moment to not only learn more about the ocean, but also how to communicate that, like communicate about the ocean through different uh, medium, so so speech and art. Um, at the same time, I had some opportunities through Orca Bowl, which is this local marine science uh, competition, sort of similar to like Quiz Bowl or Science Bowl. Um, and so through doing that, like I was a program focused around ocean literacy and training students to become like ocean leaders and to build their knowledge about the ocean environment. Um, all of those were sort of areas that helped me to build an understanding and a knowledge base for marine science. Um, at the same time, I sort of got interested in robotics uh, throughout high school. I was learning about like computer programming through like different classes um, and 
sort of found ways to start to weave those together uh, throughout high school and college through my interests and through my classes. Great. And Natasha, how about you? Can you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in all the work that you're involved with? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think a bit of my story started uh, when when I was younger, right? Um, I used to write a lot in, um, in high school and in middle school, but had really no idea where to place the work or what writing would mean to, to my life or my career. So uh, I, I took a turn where um, I just started to, to, to shift towards like playing sports, right? I was tall, I was skinny, I kind of fit the mold to, to play basketball. So I played basketball um, up until my uh, senior year. And a really funny story for my career is that uh, I got stranded in this place called Tifton, Georgia, coming back from an AAU basketball competition. I can't even find this place on the map, right? So as I landed there, I'm going to do this every day. It was just like a mall in a pizza hut. So every day I walked over to the mall and inside of the mall, there was a military recruitment center. And um, I told the woman there that when I leave high school, I am actually going to join the military. And all of my friends are like, you're crazy, that's not gonna happen. Um, so I graduate from high school and I go straight into the Air Force. So I get into the Air Force and I spend a few um, years there, but I kind of realized that I really didn't like to run. So I leave the Air Force and I say, okay, what's next for me? And then I rediscover this, this uh, this passion for creativity and for art and for writing. So I, uh, I start to do poetry and in me doing poetry, I start to uh, find myself, my voice, my story, as far as uh, uh, my family life and my sexuality. So then I start to perform in these different uh, pride spaces. Aside from that, I start to go into these different uh, poetry slams where uh, people thought I was like some sort of phenomenon. And it was even surprising to me that I was winning poetry slams. And from there, you know, different corporate gigs and universities started to say, hey, we'd like to book you. And, and people started to pay me to perform poems. But one thing that was always at the heart of, of what I was doing was um, was community. So from that, I landed myself this uh, gig with Chinola Detroit, um, which was to just act as a spokesperson, which is how I was uh, blessed enough to open up and do things like perform for uh, Mumford and & Sons and hundreds and thousands of people um, around the world. And, and from there, Science Gallery found me. Science Gallery gallery, I think, said, this is a woman who was passionate about art. This is a woman who was passionate about community. So what about you coming along and being our community engagement manager? And to be honest, I had never had any interest in the university. I had never had any interest in, in science at this part of my career. I was just a poet who liked to bring people together. So from there, I, I, I tag on with Science Gallery, but a very um, important part of my story is that my brother was murdered here in Detroit in 2013. So I took a lot of that and incorporated that into what I was doing with community and what I was doing with Science Gallery. So I started to do things like um, create an event called uh, the Steam Engine, which is bringing these different poets together. And then I created an, an event called uh, Science of Grief, where people come for 14 hours straight and are able to talk about grief that they've experienced uh, in, in their life. And all of these events, all of these programs uh, kind of bring community together. So now um, I am in the process, not in the process of, I, I have a book coming out in, in a few months. So all of those things kind of tie together from science to art, to poetry, to community and there was no one one pathway to what it is that I'm doing today. Um, I think I had a, a bunch of different paths that kind of just led me to, to one space that kind of interacts, interacts and intersects with each other. Wonderful. Yeah, it sounds like for, for most people here, there's a lot of intersections of, of interests and paths. And, and John, that's the same for you, right? So could you tell us a little bit about how you mix together different forms of media and, and your software development skills into what you do now and how you became, how you got to where you are sure. now. Sure, well, you know, I started out as a theater artist. I was very, very passionately interested in the theater after high school. I went to a theater school in New York and worked as a theater director and actor for about 10 years. And really at that time had no interest, no involvement with technology of any kind. Actually, my ideal theatrical performance would be a group of actors on a stage all dressed in black with no scenery and just all lit by candles, right? I was not engaged with technology at any point. I directed a production of Midsummer Night's Dream, the play by William Shakespeare, 
uh, on a beautiful island called Salt Spring Island off the coast of Vancouver, Canada. And uh, that was really fun, really interesting. Again, not much technology involved. But for some reason, a friend of mine took me to this barn and he said, you know, there's this guy here. You might be interested in what he's doing. And so I walked into this barn and this guy had this now this was what 1979 so this was well before the age of personal computers this was a very one of the very first personal computers he had it on a table there it was called a commodore pet and it had about as much processing power as well less processing power than most people's digital watches today but anyway he pressed a key on the computer and it made the lights that he had hung up in this barn go vroom, vroom, vroom. and i said oh how'd you do that and he said i didn't do it the computer did and I said, well, how did the computer do it? He said, I programmed it. And I said, could I do that? And he said, sure, you just have to learn how. And I said, well, I don't have a computer. And he said, well, I'll sell you mine. So I bought his computer. I had to pay it off at $30 a month, which was a lot of money to me back then. And I learned how to program in a very rudimentary way, got super interested in it, went to the university in Vancouver and talked to them about you know, I want to do art and I want to kind of combine performance and computers. And they looked at me like I was a little bit nuts, but they said, well, why don't you come and take a computer science degree? As it turned out, I learned how to write compilers and do all these things that really had nothing to do with art making. But I got really, really interested in the potential for computers to be communication devices with people. Again, this was well before the age of the Internet and computers being used for such things. But I really felt there was something amazing we could do. So I gave up the theater. I became a software researcher. I worked on graphic user interfaces and developing some of the very early versions of 3D graphics for interfaces. Um, had a wonderful career for about 10 years, but felt like something had been left behind. And, you know, we were asked to talk about inflection points. I had an inflection point where I was a successful software researcher, but I really felt like I'd left a big part of myself behind. And again, talking to friends, I started to realize there might be some way of putting my artistic work and my software work together. At that time, there was really nowhere to go to study how to put technology and art together. So I thought, well, maybe I'll create that. So I got some friends together. We went to another barn, this time in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and started to do these workshops where we just started to investigate how the computer scientists in our group could work together with the actors and the directors, the dancers, musicians, the lighting designers. And gradually, we started to build up this ability to do these kinds of projects. And I never looked back. I kept my software development work going to pay the bills, but I decided that I really needed to become an artist focused in that area. So that was about 30 years ago, and that, that's been my focus ever since. About 15 years ago, I took the job at UC Irvine because there's really tremendous support for this kind of work here. And, you know, getting back to your question, Megan, how, how do these things happen? For me, as you've just heard, it was kind of a serial, like serial as in sequential set of activities. I first of all had to become a theater artist. Then I had to become a computer software developer. Then I had to try to find some way of putting it all together. And then finally, I was able to bring it into the academic environment where I can work with students and colleagues in this area. Young people today, as we've just heard, have so many more options, especially to do these kinds of things in parallel, where you can move back and forth between being a software developer and a scientist and a researcher. And so that's the kind of work that I think is so important to be doing today. As you can see here, this is a project that I set up. This happens to be with a group of amazing ballet dancers from Russia, the Mariinsky Ballet. And you can see my uh, Connect camera there, some of the equipment I use. And what I try to do is find ways that these performing artists, because I used to be one myself, can connect with the technology, not so that it happens to them, but they really are part of it. And so I develop interactive software where essentially the performing artists can play the space like an instrument through video sensing and interactive technology. That's a great, a great segue to a wonderful question from the audience about how is creativity integral to 
everyone's research and practice and all of your work. So perhaps some people might think creativity is, is limited to artistic fields, but all of you mix your work across organizing and activism and art, art and performance and, and technology. And so, so how is creativity something that exists throughout all of those dimensions? Um, maybe Peyton, would you start? Sure. Um, I think that's definitely like a very broad question because I think it depends on what you're studying and what you're researching. Uh, very often, like there are a lot of different like ways to apply creativity and it really varies, again, based on what you're studying. Um, something that I, a story I like to tell is this project I worked on called uh, By Catch 22. Um, it was part of this internship I did with a local research organization called Foundry 10. Um, and this was focused on, uh, so it, it was sort of inspired by this field trip I did with the Seattle Aquarium where we were on board a research vessel uh, called the RV Centennial. Um, and during that we were doing this scientific trawl. Uh, so you, you take a, a net, you do a trawl where you dra drag it behind the ship and we brought up like like hundreds of thousands of different species uh, and we were trying to sort through them to find things that were uh, like relevant to the researchers at the labs. Um, and it was this very like eye-opening experience, like seeing, you know, this is a small trawl. How much, how many other species are caught in like larger nets or by commercial fisheries? Um, and, and this ties really neatly into an existing environmental issue called bycatch. That's where uh, non target species or unwanted species are caught in commercial fisheries and uh, they have to be manually sorted through and oftentimes there are casualties before they end up back in the water. So uh, during my time at F Foundry 10 I was able to sort of bring in that inspiration and that conservation message into Bycatch 22 which is this virtual reality game players are sort of challenged with sorting through all of these different fish and other marine creatures. Um, and it was this really cool way to like exercise creativity and artistic direction. Like how do I represent this experience uh, as well as bringing in the programming aspect? How do I use this new technology and give people the ability to interact with it? Um, and then also bringing in environmental adv advocacy and marine science. Like how do you tell a message in a way that's effective to get people thinking about sustainability and also in a way that's accurate. So I think there are a lot of crossovers and very often like, just to get back to the original question, how is creativity integral to scientific research? There's a lot of creativity in how you communicate your research as well as like how you go about doing that research because science has so many crossovers with other fields. Awesome. Um, Natasha, what about you? How is creativity part of your work, um, your personal work, your your poetry, and your work with Science Gallery, um, Science Gallery in, in Detroit, and all of your other work? How do they mix together with a, a creative? Yeah, practice? I mean, I think the the first thing that comes to mind um, when it comes to, to to integrating creativity is that at the heart of what we do with Science Gallery, we try to make science technology and design and design accessible, right? And we make that accessible through creative forms, right? The people in my community, the people here in Detroit, especially these young adults, um, don't have the opportunities that a, a lot of young adults have uh, who, who are from different places of the world, right? We're in the inner city. And I think about when I was growing up and um, when I was in high school, I really didn't have that much access to this advanced form of science and technology, right? So with me getting into this position, I said to myself, okay, how how do you make this fun? And by you making it fun and by you making it creative, then you make it accessible. Uh, one example here is my uh, colleague who was our head of program at Antoine Scott. He worked with a, uh, a scent artist named Cicel Tolis. And what she did was she went into this community of Detroit, Southwest Detroit, and she created what she called these scentscapes based off of different neighborhoods that exist within that neighborhood that will one day be obsolete, right? So it's like, how do I remind these people of, of the smells in their community, of the things that once existed? Now, if I present this, um, 
to these young adults, just as stated, you know, this is something they probably would not have understood, right? So the second thing we did was we took these kids who had probably never ever experienced um, an art museum like the Broad Museum on Michigan State campus. We took them there to see the exhibition, but not only were they able to see the exhibition, we brought out these famous poets and uh, famous dance choreographers and, and famous writers from around the world to do workshops with them to teach these kids how to tell their own story in a way that this scientist, that this scent artist, that this male artists have told the story of their community. So I think it's been uh, very simple for me here at, at, as a poet. When I think about the grief that I've experienced over losing my brother, um, there was a lot of research that I wanted to do about what grief looks like, what type of uh, shapes and forms do grief take on. Uh, you know, we brought a neuroscientist to our science degree to explain how grief physically affects the body, right? And then I took that and I wrote a book of poems that is uh, the, the butcher book that I talk about that's coming out um, in a few months based off of the grief that I was experiencing. And that creativity, I feel like gave me access to my own answers, access to my own grief, access to my own healing. So I think that when, when I think about the integration of uh, creativity into science and, and into technology, it's very simple for me coming from the inner city. It's really just about uh, creativity, making uh, art and science very accessible. Mm -hmm. That's a great, great answer. Um, Caleb, what about you, about how creativity is involved with your work and also about how it's connecting with community and, and, that, and that kind of thing? Yeah, sure. I, I think uh, being within the design profession, creativity is like inherent in a lot of what we do. But as I've been doing it for some time, thinking about how I begin to define it, has been uh, pretty interesting, I guess. Uh, and so I think one of the ways that I would really see it as, um, well, one component I would think that's really important to it is understanding a sense of history or past. Uh, for me, I, I look at a lot of uh, methods and procedures and um, more or less the standard way about uh, doing projects. And um, for me, creativity is in the question of um, interrogating those uh, like those past processes to um, innovate or to create new ways or new pathways for um, creating. Uh, where it boundaries certain technologies and um, different methods, it, it's um, to me an ability of connection, uh, being able to make certain connections between um, projection work and built work um, and a lot of the conversations within aesthetics. So when I think of creativity in my own practice, it has a lot to do with making connections uh, through cross-disciplinary means. Um, as I look to uh, bolster a concept or uh, develop the groundings of projects, um, I don't just look at you know a historical path, but I question it to see how it could bend or how it could shift into other directions to support uh, new narratives. Um, and so, as a maker, it's always trying to create new ways or uh, discover new ways of putting things together, whether it be with metal and welding and wood, new combinations between materials, um, but also combinations between these static materials and technology. Um, a lot of my projects I feel like are straddled between these uh, um, more or less general understandings of uh, physical materiality of things and the digital presence and virtual aspect to a lot of our everyday communication. And so uh, creatively, it's really uh, a puzzle and a constant challenge to figure out how these two realms can communicate through space or through objects on the body and prosthetics or through built interventions, which begin to raise awareness of these two sides of our reality or the world we live in today. Um, so I would, I mean, it, Again, with such a, a openness to uh, what creativity is, um, for me, I think that is really something that anchors it in my practice of um, understanding multiple realms, being able to make these connections and use it to divert or create new narratives for um, different social issues, as well as uh, technical aspects of invention.
Wonderful. And and John, so you, you touched a little bit on your active space uh, concept and um, maybe you could share a bit more about that and how creativity is integral throughout your work, both in software and in the direction of intermedia projects and things like that. Sure, well, I think we've heard, you know, some really great examples already of people that essentially don't respect the boundary between the artificial boundary between science and technology and art making. Um, there is no boundary. To me, it's a two way street. You can't if you define yourself as only a scientist, only a technologist, only an artist, you're really limiting yourself and limiting your potential. Think about Albert Einstein, who everyone I'm sure has heard of Einstein, the probably one of the greatest physicists of all time. He was actually a really amazing violinist and pianist. And his point of view was that all great scientists are artists as well. Einstein felt that insight didn't necessarily come from thinking things through or studying more or learning knowledge. He felt that imagination had more to do with scientific discovery than any talent for knowledge or scientific practice. Um, so how do we connect that? And how do we make that work for ourselves as people who are interested in connecting science and art? For me, it comes down to thinking about 21st century technology, the technologies that we are embracing every day in the contemporary world. I feel it's our, at least it's my obligation as an artist to find ways to engage that. So about 25 years ago, I came up with this idea of, as I mentioned before, being able to play the space as an instrument. And um, you saw a slide a minute ago, and I think we'll see some more in a couple of minutes, showing people working in my active space system, which is really designed to make the environment that a dancer or actor or musician is in responsive to their activities. And when the dancer is then performing in that environment, and here you're seeing it in kind of a workshop environment, the creativity becomes an, uh, a duet between the performer and perhaps the image of the performer or an image of another performer where the technology really becomes an important part of the activity and the interaction with it isn't by you know typing on a keyboard or scrolling on a phone or clicking a mouse the interaction is about f fully embodied engagement um, what i call embodied interaction with the technology. So for me, my path really is finding ways that we can connect the contemporary technologies we are using every day and kind of push the boundaries of them. That's another aspect of the engagement between science and technology that sometimes people don't think about quite enough, that artists can help us move technology development forward by instead of using technology to solve the problems of today, they can look at the possibilities of the future. And that's really, I think, what artists can contribute to technology development. And then the flip side of that is people who work with technology can find ways to dream and be imaginative in their work. And rather than necessarily using technology to make more money or solve a known problem, even important problems like we're facing with um, environmental degradation or um, issues related to the problems in the ocean, let's not so much focus it on how we solve these problems, but really how we dream, how we imagine that humanity can live in a more sustainable and resilient way with the world that we inhabit. And artists have always been the leaders in describing that kind of approach. Absolutely. I think that all, everyone here um, is, is really engaging in such wonderful transdisciplinary and intersectional works across the board. Um, how about, could, could each of you share one of your works in a little bit more detail so we can hear about a piece you've recently done or had done in the past and that you'd like to share? Does anyone want to go first? Ocean, my about? ocean. Sure. Uh, I'll dive right in and talk about your ocean, my ocean, which um, follows uh, the, some of the ideas I've just described about. I was interested in making a piece where performing artists, dancers and musicians can connect with 
the feelings that we have about the ocean and find ways to express those in a performing arts context. This was actually done in a theater environment, not on the beach or anything, but I felt that it was super important to find ways that we could express our feelings, not only our wonderful positive feelings about how beautiful the oceans and coastlines are and how important they are to us, but also how we are so uh, concerned about environmental degradation and all the problems facing the ocean. And so um, what you're seeing here is an dancer inhabiting um, a, a piece of scenery that turned from a flock of seabirds all the way to being uh, a waving ocean and uh, then was rolled up and carried off the stage by the performers. Uh, the piece had several different segments. One segment was looking at plastics and how um, plastics are causing such immense problems in the ocean from disposable bottles, fishing lines. And the dancers here began with a section where they were beautiful and free and kind of roaming the stage as if it was the ocean and then gradually getting more and more tangled up in these bottles and strings of plastics. We had a wonderful choreographer, Molly Lynch, who designed this aspect of it and worked with dancers from UC Irvine to bring it to life. Um, we actually had four choreographers in the piece. Um, Tong Wang put together a section where he was able to think about the things that happen with um, oil and water mixing or not mixing and pollution that comes from uh, uh, interactions with the ocean. Um, and that uh, then uh, went into another section where we had um, a very uh, beautiful refuge section choreographed by Lisa Noggle, where um, her dancers uh, found ways to connect out to the world. Um, so uh, the refuge itself uh, choreographed by Lisa Noggle connected with the earlier parts choreographed by Lindsay Gilmore and these four choreographers brought their passion and their ideas about the ocean together in a framework that I created and did the media design for and even though we weren't specifically lecturing people about the problems in the ocean environment or the opportunities for beauty and, and refuge and reconciliation, I think the audience was able to absorb that uh, kind of subliminally. And it really ended up being quite a poetic piece that we performed both at University of California, Irvine, and at Brown University, um, where we actually uh, also worked with a number of faculty and students from Rhode Island School of Design to create some of the scenic and uh, musical elements. So really, it was a collaborative piece where we brought together about 75 people from across the country to address these issues of oceans and coastlines in a poetic and evocative way. Wonderful. And Caleb, what about you? Could you share quickly a little bit about your recent ocean ocean project? Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the recent projects I've been involved in was um, right now still a proposal, but I thought it was a great exercise to um, thinking about uh, design in new innovative ways. Um, this project, the MIAB project, was a proposal for a floating art piece on Boston's Fort Point Channel. Um, they usually do this once a year, but uh, as a designer building mostly on land, the challenge of building on water provided a, 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 a great test of skill and innovation to just think newly about um, uh, floating pieces. Uh, there's one approach of building a floating uh, barge and almost like a floating barge to just put something on top of, uh, like a floating platform or a stage in which many artists had taken that route to uh, uh, design for something on the water. Um, one of the approaches that I wanted to take was uh, to design something that's integral to the water and integral to its site. Um, the title of this project is Message in a Bottle um, in reference to uh, old form of communication where people would write messages, put them in the bottle and send them out into the sea for people on the other side of the ocean to discover or pirates or colonials to pick up in the ocean. 
Um, but this is a little bit of a modern twist. Um, instead of someone writing the bottle or writing the message to be put in the bottle, um, the second part of this title was written by the ocean. And so after spending some time kind of looking at existing uh, floating structures, like uh, different types of buoys, different types of ballasts, um, familiarizing myself with certain oceanic uh, signifiers and devices, um, I'd come up with an idea to adapt these um, similar forms of physics, uh, playing with buoyancy, um, to develop this project where uh, the ocean is able to commun itself, uh, communicate itself to us. I think there's uh, different levels to how you can interpret the project. One, it, the device itself, but then the, also the poetic aspect of, um, again, the ocean has a lot to say. Um, now, as we recognize a lot of the climate issues, a lot of issues with pollution, um, as a designer is looking to create a mediary device for um, the ocean to say something or display something to us. Um, so as this works is the main ballast pretty much sits anchored in the water um, with a constant buoyancy, but the orange ring around it is able to float up and down um, as it is affected by ripples or waves within the ocean. Um, this paired with a UV, a luminescent material, similar to the uh, natural materials of uh, glowing aquatic animals deep within uh, the ocean, um, it begins to speak to that uh, in a material sense as well. Um, so this was a, a, a great small proposal of like taking on new ideas, new territory uh, to build but also anchoring it in a, in a position of mediation, um, taking myself out of it and putting it as a tool or a device um, that could communicate on the behalf of uh, the large ocean we have on our planet. Um, so this was a, um, you know, done with reasonable scope, looking at uh, different types of materials I could use, different types of um, uh, production I could use, uh, to fabricate most of this by myself, including some uh, some programming, uh, electrical engineering for power and solar, um, but definitely a fun project. That was one of my only really uh, uh, design project relative to the ocean, but I think speaks a lot towards the uh, type of connections and methods that I look at to situate my work in site-specific areas. Um, this, of course, it was supposed to be in the channel, but I could imagine there being multiple, uh, multiple of these devices cast out in different areas or different parts of the shore. Um, so um, a great uh, a great example of kind of like how things could be stitched together uh, and speak about them creatively. Beautiful. And speaking of being at sea, so Peyton, you spent some time on Nautilus and created a, a travel log of that experience. Do you want to give a, a quick share about that and plug plug that work that you did? Yeah, have? of course. So uh, I interned on Nautilus through their science and engineering internship program. Uh, for any students that are interested, there's more information about that on the Nautilus website. Um, but during that experience, I wanted to find a way to sort of share what I was doing with friends and family. And I ended up creating a series of comics that eventually became a graphic travelogue called uh, Live from the Deep. Um, so that was like a something I originally like intended for social media, just posting comics about what I was working on and the research we were doing. Um, I was on for two expeditions that were sort of exploring um, some marine archaeology as well as uh, actual exploration of like some of the national marine sanctuaries in that area. Um, and it started off mostly focused on that science and research aspect and then quickly became a way for me to include like my own personal voice. So not only did I get to talk about like, you know, talk about what we're doing in like spaces like the control room, like what are we looking at when we're exploring underwater, but also what is that experience like? How does it feel? Um, and what's it like to be on board the ship and I explore ocean research? Um, so 
<clears throat> excuse me. Um, I think that was really fun in terms of being able to, yeah, work in my personal voice and also explore engaging people with science in kind of a more personal personal way through comics. Uh, there, I think we do have a link somewhere if people are interested in checking it out. Um, I also have some of them on my Instagram, but that was a really cool opportunity. And if any other students are interested in learning more about that or about Nautilus, uh, check out the Nautilus website for more opportunities there. Wonderful. Thanks, Peyton. And Natasha, really quickly, do you want to share um, a little bit more about uh, one of your recent projects? Yeah, um, I think the project that I always go back to, to be honest, is um, is the Science of Grief project. And it's because it has taken on so many lives over the past three years. You know, it's a project that really kind of stemmed from the exploration of my own grief and um, me kind of getting up and, and using my connections in the community to create the space um, at the Detroit Institute of Arts in year one, you know, where people were just able to just come, you know, regular people from the community and say, hey, this is some sort of grief that I'm dealing with over some sort of loss, loss that I've experienced. And then, you know, we would have uh, therapists and grief counselors and clergy and all these different resources where people were able to deal with their, their grief past the 14 hours that they actually got to spend with us. And then, you know, in year two, I talk about my colleague who was our head of program and, you know, brought that science in and that research in by bringing these different neuroscientists in, you know, to, to actually help people explain and articulate, you know, what, what they feel like. And that has taken on a life of its own for the last three years um, during a pandemic. We actually connected with Science Gallery International and our uh, sisters in Dublin and our Science Gallery sisters at Emory in Atlanta. And we created this program that was a direct response to uh, the grief that people were experiencing because of uh, the pandemic that we're all experiencing right now. And in December, we're actually um, doing two things. One, we're gearing up for a podcast where we're letting young adults actually uh, host and moderate the podcast and deal with issues of grief in the communities of uh, you know young adults and teenagers that typically isn't explored or ignored. And then we're doing um, a program about seasonal depression and what it's gonna feel like for the holidays this year when you have you know at least 200,000 families that will be without somebody for the first time. So I think that has been one of our most important projects uh, today. The Science Gallery is something that we plan on doing probably for the next uh, five to, to 10 years. And there's a lot of personal projects, but I think that's one that's the perfect um, fusion of science and art and also at the heart of what I do, which is a uh, community. Awesome. Wonderful. Okay, I would love to hear more from all of you, but we're running a little short on time. So I'm gonna ask you each to share one piece of quick advice for anybody out there looking to pursue similar paths or careers in their life. Um, John, how about you go first? One piece of advice. My advice is to follow your heart, follow your passion and do what really speaks to you in terms of your own connection and your impact in the world. Don't try to please somebody else. Don't do it for anyone else other than yourself, but then find ways to open your heart so that everything you're doing connects out to all the wonderful people around you. Awesome. And I'll jump in and I'll do it. Caleb, did you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, I think, let's see, uh, embrace challenge, embrace change, and make adaptability one of your uh, a helpful, adaptability is a, a super helpful. I think as we all recognize these changes that we're going through today, as uh, many things are affecting our lives, um, you know, although challenging, the, the passion, again, following your heart pulls you through it and uh, staying adaptable gives you the ability to uh, navigate uh, regardless of the circumstances. So yeah, I would say um, one thing is just to find you a mentor that is fitting with whatever it, whatever it is that you're looking to do in your career. I found, I found a mentor very early on and uh, one of the things my mentor taught me was to create a network and use the network, call the people, ask people to help you. Um, you know, don't be afraid to, to invite people to where you are, to go to places where people are, you know, especially if you're dealing with art. So just kind of create a network of people. And I say, find you a mentor that that is within the realms of what it is that you're looking to do and follow the footsteps of that person while creating your own footsteps as well. 
Um, I think like two things. One, imposter syndrome is super real. It hit me really hard going into college. Um, and know that that's really common and overcoming that like comparison can be really helpful. The second thing is like, I think you've heard from both me and Natasha's stories that there are a lot of organizations out there that are looking to work with young people to further your career and increase your access to science, art, and technology. So look for those opportunities and take advantage of them. Again, there are people out there that want to help you and help create opportunities for you. Thank you all so much for joining us here and showing how exploring science and technology and the ocean is not just for scientists, but it really it really spreads across all people and how transdisciplinary practice can be part of anybody's work. So thank you all so much for joining us and stay tuned for our future events. You can check those out at nautiluslive.org backslash education backslash events. Next week, we will have a webinar and a workshop partnered with NASA JPL. So check out the details for that. And tomorrow we are embarking on our last leg of the Nautilus season this year. It's a mapping expedition um, around so Southern California. And yeah, meanwhile, check out our, our updates or, and our highlights from our uh, successful season this past year. And thank you all so much for joining us again. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us.